Well, uh, do we um, get to have a beer now while we're doing that? <laughs> it would be nice, yeah. This could be vodka, I'm not sure. Um, Just but, joking. Uh, well, thank you, too, for those, those presentations. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm guessing there's, there's time for beer afterwards, yes. Um, but, uh, so we won't take up too much of your time. Um, but uh, um, I'll, I'll definitely, um, I know there's probably lots of questions um, in the audience, but uh, I have a few of my own that I want to kind of start out with. Um, and uh, I, guess, I guess, Don, since, since you just, um, you know, sort of finished off on, on the battery discussion, I just want to pick up um, right off there. Um, and, you know, you, you talked about um, the Brattle Group, which is a very well-respected um, um, analysis group that, you know, um, our Texas state uh, regulatory um, agencies use to, to analyze policy. Uh, the Battle Group found that, um, um, you know, large-scale energy storage on the grid, um, you know, is economical up to a point. Um, but it's only if you kind of realize the, um, the benefits on sort of both sides of this divide we have in Texas, which is, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the transmission um, and, and the uh, generation side. Right. And uh, those two have been divided. I'm wondering if, wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about um, how, how we could realize, um, if we didn't have the regulatory hurdle that, we'll, that I'll ask it, um, right. in, in a little bit, how we can kind of realize uh, benefits on both sides. Sure. So, I, and that's part of what we'd, we'd ask Brattle is come up with this mechanism to figure out how we keep the deregula deregulation gap in place between the competitive business and the, and the, and the utilities. And what, what they um, came out with, which, which I think is very novel, is that we, we the, the utility, put the batteries in rate base. We're going to we're going to need to put them on our distribution system. We're going to need to be just working it into our T&D planning because a large part of the benefit on our side will come from the amount of investment we can actually defer by using these batteries that are, are going to be there being used by the competitive market. And now we'll, we can at least push off investment in the T&D system because you have the battery there. So that's in rate base. We have low cost of capital. Um, we, we, can, uh, we have the crews in place. We have the, the right of way, which is critical in place, that we, where we can put them. Then what we do is we, through a, a, number, a number of different ways you can envision this, but auction off that co battery capacity to the merchant side. So like I said, on, on that blue sky day, uh, like we were having in Dallas when I left, we only need about seven megawatt hours to meet all the reliability needs of the system, all the outages, the cars hitting the poles and so forth. So if we have, say, 2,000 megawatts on our system, and we only need seven of it, 6,000 megawatt hours, we only need seven of them, that's a lot to be, uh, to, that the merchant guys can, take, can use. And so the notion would be you, you auction that off to them, they then basically are buying or leasing um, a space on the electron warehouse. They can store their electrons there when they want to. They can bring them out when they want to. Think about an Amazon fulfillment facility or whatever you want to envision. But it basically becomes a place where the, the generators can take the cheap overnight power that may be as low as 20 to 25 bucks typically, put that into the, put that into the, into the electron warehouse, and then either use it for ancillary services or use it during those really expensive hours during the day, especially in the summers um, or in the deep winters, um, to make the most of the arbitrage. We don't get into that business. We don't have anything to do with it. The, the merchant side does that. Their trading desks um, decide when to use it. We've just got to make sure the battery is able to charge and discharge as needed uh, to, meet those, uh, to meet those needs. So we basically, and the notion would be for, for taking a, a, what they would pay us to use that warehouse, what we would get off of, of the deferrals, you, you then get a free reliability machine. So it, it, all, get, it all gets paid for through those for the, on the bill, and then the reliability improvements you get out of it become free. But right now, it, it, it seems like this would require a change in, in Texas law, Absolutely. or at least a clarification yes. in Texas law. Yes. And can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, your, I guess, ideal timeline, too? Um, there isn't any legislation right now, because you just kind of came up came out with this uh, in right. November, uh, but, but what, what are you envisioning there? No, I, we've been talking with, with market participants, regulators, legislators, and you know, this, this is an, it's a novel idea. It's, it's certainly uh, a relook at, 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 the, at, the, at the model, and we can, we, those conversations continue. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback and a lot of 
things that we've, we've thought about and, and gone back to Brattle and talked with them about, but how we might refine it. And um, those, those conversations continue. So, you know, the pricing that we were looking at doesn't even, doesn't even foreseeably come around until the 18, 19, 20 re realm anyway. Um, I say that and then, you know, the next manufacturer will come out and hit it next year. But um, so we've got time and, and we've got time to have those conversations. Okay, great. And, uh, and, and, and Larry, I, I want to, you know, get back to you here. Um, and, and, and you laid out a, a very ambitious, um, uh, laid out Austin Energy's very ambitious plans too, which sort of combines, um, you know, a, a huge chunk of, a, um, you know, a, a, a big goal for renewable energy, 55% by 2025. Is that yes. correct? Um, yes. al along with being in the 50th uh, bottom or the, the 50th percentile for um, pricing, and I'm wondering just how do you kind of make those things work? You're you're, you're here in Austin, um, you have you have a, a lot of environmental groups, uh, you know, um, go, going out in front of the Capitol talking about you know that we need to transition from a um, you know to clean power, uh, but at the same time you don't want to impact your rate pair as much. I mean, how how do you kind of juggle those those two goals? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, the reality of it is that uh, there's, you know, first of all, like I talked about earlier, we're in a unique market in ERCOT, okay? So you can put renewable resources anywhere within the ERCOT grid, and really, uh, we're, we're qualified queasy, and uh, that's a scheduling entity in ERCOT, and uh, we also own all of our own generator generation, so different from the deregulated market, we're totally vertically integrated and we sell all of our generation into the market and then we, uh, all of our customers, so right now, uh, uh, we're on UT campus though, that gets more complicated, <laughs> but uh, the reality of it is is that um, we buy all of our power off the ERCOT grid. So all of our power comes to our customers off the grid. We sell our generation into the grid, okay? So we really have to have a wholesale portfolio that's attractive in order to keep it down. So real simply, what that means is that we have to have, we're part owners of a nuclear plant, we're part owners of a coal plant, we're part owners, and we own gas facilities, um, high efficient gas facilities. And the way, fundamentally the way it works is that you've got, in order to leverage up the amount of renewables that you have, uh, some of it early on was higher cost, we have to make money in the ERCOT market with our low cost generation to offset it. And so that's the strategy. You can't just come out and just do renewable alone, particularly where we have effectively stranded costs in debt and, and, and generation that we own. Sure. So we just can't, you, you, don't, you just don't get somebody says, time out, game over, start over again. It doesn't work that way. So that's how we do it, and that's, that's a part of our strategy. Now, wind prices have come down. The last wind projects that we've struck are in the low three cent re region, They're really good. I think everybody knows that we're a little south of a nickel on our 150 megawatt solar project, um, and we're in an energy-only market in ERCOT. Um, frankly, we would benefit from a, somewhat of a little bit of a capacity market in ERCOT as well. But uh, that's that's basically how we do. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into the whole capacity market <laughs> debate here. That was no, uh, we don't. <laughs> luckily, th that has died down a little bit in the past uh, months. If y'all were here what, uh, late, uh, I guess like September, last September or so, that was uh, pretty fierce. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so I, I, I guess Larry then, and you know, you mentioned, you know, Austin Energy's integrated into the ERCOT market even though, um, um, you know, even though you're muni utility and, and, and regulated by the, by the city, but is, is there some level of, you know, if you're trying to educate your, your customers, um, is, is there any, Ever any time when when you're talking about you know what percentage of renewables um, you know Austin Energy is, is striving for when you just want to say hey just so you know this is kind of all one grid and 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 um, you know we're, we're interacting yeah. outside of Austin. Well, uh, you, you hit on it, Jim, because really what it is is all of the renewables that we acquire are really for the benefit of the entire ERCOT grid. And so really what's happening is our customers are stepping out and saying. We want to show everybody the way that we can buy a lot of renewable energy and operate within the ERCOT system and deliver it and be affordable to customers, okay? So um, it's really leveraging, our customers have decided through their, our policymakers, which are effectively our board as the city council, and they've decided to have these goals and when they have these goals, what they're really saying is that our customers are going to subsidize 
and acquire renewable resources that are for the betterment of the whole of ERCOT. But at the same time, ERCOT, from hour to hour, some hours of the year, is maybe even approaching 30% renewable as, as a grid, right. depending on the mm -hmm. times. Uh, because most of the wind in Texas is merchant. In other words, they were built by a developer and they're sold into ERCOT. As of yet, there's very little solar that's being done that way. I expect as prices go down, we'll see some of that where, uh, what I'd like to see is that Austin Energy doesn't have to go out and demonstrate it, that what will happen is merchant generation of renewables will be low enough that we can kind of step out of that market and say, okay, let me go play with batteries and storage and other things and kind of step away from, from, from that leadership role. But I think clearly what we're trying to do is demonstrate that it can be done. Sure, sure. And, you, and you're saying too, you know, when you're talking about Austin Energy being, you know, it, it, if it gets to that 55% renewable goal, that's, um, you know, a lot of people kind of who don't maybe understand the market will look at that and say, oh, oh my gosh, like 55% renewable energy, the lights are going to go out or, you know, what have you. But, but you know, there's obviously this way you're interacting with the outside grid and, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, um, Don, Don, while we're sort of still on this, um, um, you know, talking about portfolios and portfolio standards, um, you and I were talking a little bit about b before this. I'm not sure if anyone had had heard. Um, there is a um, a bill in the legislature um, this session to sunset um, Texas's renewable energy por portfolio standard and and the program that um, um, set that up, uh, which. We've, we've shattered the, the standard. I was wondering if just, you know, um, in case anyone's following the legislature out there, um, if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, is that, uh, is that a sign of us backtracking on, on renewable energy, or do, do you see that as particularly problematic? Right, no, it's a good question. And, and, and just to a little, little background, when the renewable standards were set back in what was it 99 2000 2001 yeah. I mean <laughs> yeah and and then the and then the wind farms came and said well, look you're you're asking us you're encouraging us to build all this wind there's no transmission out to west texas it, it, you know the, 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 the all the load centers are in, are in dallas austin san antonio and houston and um, there's not a whole lot of transmission capacity between between that 35 corridor in west texas so you're going to have to help us so the, the legislature also Past the CRES, competitive renewable energy zones, where what I think is a, is a very is a great partnership between the industry, the utility, and the regulator to come up with okay, we got to build a lot of transmission. We don't know what the wind's going to be built. The wind's not going to be built until they know where the transmission's going to be. So let's all figure this out in advance. Here's where the wind's probably going to be. Here's here's where the wind says they're going to be. Now we'll build the transmission of those areas while you're building the wind farms. Wind farms take several months, those transmission lines took five years to build in some cases because of the distances covered. So we've, we built that to, to support 18,000 megawatts of wind in West Texas. Right now there's about 16,000 headed towards 18 over the next couple of years. So we, we, we sized it right. At the time there's a lot of criticism we'd sized it too big, but we, I don't, I don't mean Encore, I mean the state, um, the PUC, and uh, but they, they turned out to be very correct on that. So now we've got our 18,000 megawatt backbone transmission system out to West Texas, and the wind continues to get built. Like I said, the, 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 the standard was actually raised in the early part of the decade to 5,000. Well, we've shattered that too. Um, the bottom line is there's no more incentive to incent a wind development. The wind developers are here, they're continuing to build. It's, one of, it's a rich Texas resource. And so I think what the legislators are, are saying is, we don't need this anymore, and, and the CRES process has run its course. Now we'll just build transmission to the new farms as needed, like we have the past 75 years to generation. So I, I think it is something that's past its, its time, and it's not backtracking. We see no end, really, to our now gradual um, increase in wind. And once you have an industry like that that's now on its own two legs, there's, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of need to invite the criticism to prop it up. It doesn't need propped up anymore in Texas. Great, great, and, and that trend will obviously be really important too, assuming that uh, certain EPA regulations push forward Absolutely. too. And, and um, it's, it's um, I think a lot of folks are still, you know, probably not many of you in the room, but a lot of folks outside of this room are probably still surprised to see how much of a leader Texas is in, in wind energy in particular. So it's interesting to, to follow that. Um, and uh, I just have one more question for Larry, and then I'll open it up if, if or, um, 
Oh, okay, gotcha. Actually, I will open it up for your questions, and uh, apologies for, for going over. Um, if anybody um, wants to raise their hand and shout out, and since we don't have much time, I guess use your outdoor voice to, to, to reach the stage. Are there any questions? Any, any bold have, folks? Yeah. I'll have a question. So, so recently, and I don't know if you want to comment on it, but for the, for the audience and perhaps for those that in ETAs that are uh, not necessarily in the power industry but are trying to help and collaborate in innovation and smart grid and all these other technologies, uh, recently Georgetown announced <coughs> that they were going to go 100% renewable energy. And could you comment or elaborate on how can Georgetown do that uh, using uh, wind? And how is that possible when they're surrounded by Encore and they're you know, somewhat next to Austin Energy and LCRA and other grids? How, how can they go 100% renewable energy? Are you, are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm going to try to say this politically correct and not get in trouble. But basically, the way products work is that you can, you can purchase a lot of product. Uh, you can buy contractual product without physically owning the renewable assets, OK? So I don't care what the company name is or whether it's wind or solar or what it is. And uh, we, th there's rec tags in the market, um, OK? So we know uh, it's a little bit different than the w a Western interconnected system, the WEX system, where there's Regis that's kind of like the, like the renewable cop. They kind of keep track of who's tagging renewables here and there. And uh, outside of that, I think that I don't know the particulars of their deal, but um, we've been approached by companies that have a product that is 100% solar or renewable or whatever it might be, but it is also fortified with other product because as uh, it can't be 24-7 solar, at least um, last time I looked. <laughs> but uh, uh, so it has to be it has to be some type of product that they've developed. And I'd let Georgetown speak for it because it, it, I, I, I mean, the physics are it's not going to be 100% solar all the time. So I think it's probably some kind of product that they purchased uh, from a solar company. Um, and we, we've been approached by those as well. Instead of signing up PPAs for wind or wherever it might be, uh, how, about we, how about we do it for you and, and, and you'll be happy. So that's kind of how I see it. So presumably the, the company that they contracted with would be on the hook for that much power, most of it coming from the solar plant, but they might need to I supplement it somehow. I, spec you know, I speculate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, no, I think I'm Don just right. I mean, I've talked to you know, some of the, the C&I customers who, who have some renewable mandates nationwide, and they love Texas because they can go out and buy from a central wind farm or solar farm or a mix like Larry was talking about through their retail provider, they can buy that and they don't have to do the uneconomic option of putting it on, on site. I mean, solar panels are solar panels and they're just a lot cheaper to put out in West Texas in the middle of nowhere in, in, big, in big farms and, they, and it will be for quite some time. I think, uh, you know, what, what customers and the public in general have a difficulty with is there's a difference between the steady state physics of an electric grid and who's keeping my lights on and mm -hmm. what happens on paper. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's, where we, where, that's where we get in trouble sometimes, right? And uh, so the storage opportunity, though, is unique, particularly the microgrid opportunity, because the self-sustaining, self-healing ability of how you apply storage, and that's what we're going to see in the future, is that it brings, it brings the use of renewables or their use of tools for reliability or the use of, of uh, products covering outages or everything. And you know, the examples that I've always thought of is, you know, you could bring this battery pack in on a trailer and I don't have to worry about a transmission outage to a substation. I can carry the load for customers for a few hours and they aren't going to know anything. And we can get up there and change the switch or, the trans or some insulators or something like that. So there's a lot of different aspects to it. but. One of the things that will it will enable is some of the steady state abilities to say, yeah, I am supported. I am a, you know, it's interesting. Small utilities have more opportunity to use these tools than big ones. And I gave a speech in Montana last year to a, a large group of predominant electric co-ops on that. So anyway, enough said. And are, are we out of time, or do we have time for one more bold? Uh, okay. All right, gotcha. Well. 
I, I think we're going to cut it off then, because that, that, that sounds pretty important. <laughs> right. But uh, if, if y'all could g give these two, two guys a round of applause. And thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.